Welcome to Bold and Blunt, the Washington Times video version. I'm here with Amir Sarfati in Jerusalem. Thank you so much, Amir, for doing this with me. Thank you, Cheryl. It's good to be here with you. So I wanted to speak with you about Bible prophecy specifically because you are the expert in that field. But I wonder if you can just give listeners uh, and watchers a little bit of brief background about your religious beliefs, um, your service in the military in Jerusalem, and so forth. So I grew up uh, in... Uh, a Jewish family, a secular Jewish family. I uh, grew up also in foster care from the age of 6 to 18. And then uh, I came to faith in Yeshua, in both the Old and the New Testament, and in the Messiah, at the age of 18. Okay. Uh, since then, I'm what we call Messianic Jew here in the country. Um, I joined the IDF shortly after I got saved, and um, I served first in the Armored Corps, and then I uh, graduated the Officers Academy and became an officer in the Israeli uh, government uh, uh, of the West Bank at that time. We, we were controlling Gaza, Judea, and Samaria in the early 1990s. Right. Um, I ended up being the deputy governor and the one that uh, had to implement the Oslo Accord when uh, the Palestinian Authority was uh, assembled together and took a responsibility over uh, the city of Jericho. Okay. And so I was behind the, the implementation of it. And then, uh, and that's it. And since then, I'm no longer in active service, but I, I used to do uh, reserve duty uh, until my mid 40s. Okay, and just for um, the Washington Times audience, just ex explain a little bit more what a Messianic Jew is, and then also bring me up yeah. to date on what you're doing right now. No I know problem. you have an organization and so forth. So we use the word Messianic just because it follows the word Messiah. We believe in Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. The thing is, uh, if we would identify ourselves as Christians following the Greek word Christos, it would be understood here in Israel as if we change religions or completely defected to a different cultural group. And therefore, we're using a term called Messianic Jew, which is basically, I mean, there's really no difference between me and a Gentile believer, just the fact that I was born a Jew and I'm still a Jew. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's the same thing. We, we believe both in the Old and New Testament and in the Messiah, which is the only way, truth, and life. And so that's where I am. You can uh, find it as an equivalence to a, what we call evangelical Christians of today okay. in America. Okay. And uh, so this is, this is more or less how I believe. So nowadays you have an organization Correct. and you travel and you speak about Bible prophecy Correct. primarily, yes? Yes. I started an organization that is called Behold Israel because I, I believe that there is a great misunderstanding of Israel today. Modern day Israel uh, is not a, uh, some, some episode that is the fruit of the imagination of some people or some uh, uh, idea that is uh, uh, with an <coughs> expiration date in the next few years. Modern day Israel is standing right in between the history of the Bible and the future of Bible prophecy. And if you don't understand what modern day Israel is all about, you will not understand what we were and what is going to happen. I think that there's a lot of people, a lot of scholars that are teaching about archaeology and history. They will all be super experts about what had happened because we found evidences already. Very few are willing to take the risk and not only talk about what happened in the past, but also about what will happen in the future. And why is it? Because there's a lot of kooks in that mm -hmm. field that have their own thing going on. We aim, we strive to teach what the Bible says that is going to happen in the future. And it, almost all Bible prophecies somehow related to Israel. Right. So if you don't understand Israel, you will not understand what is next in the plan of God. So Bible prophecy, it's almost, a th what, 30% almost of yes. the Bible? Um, which a lot of churches in America, they don't even want to touch on prophecy. Correct. Which is odd because it's such a large portion. It's odd because uh, it will cause them to have to admit in two things. A, that they have to deal with current events as well because everything that happens today is either fulfillment of prophecy 
or in preparation for what is going to be fulfilled. So if they don't want to touch this, you know, Israel thing, they don't want, they cannot teach prophecy. Right. It's not going to happen. You have to be very brave to uh, uh, approach Israel with a biblical lens and teach on the fact that this is not the, 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 the uh, I would say, the uh, outcome of men's effort, but of God's plan. And, um, you know, oftentimes uh, people have a hard time with it. Pe a lot of people grew up in Reformed theology background, which taught that the church has had replaced Israel. Therefore, uh, God has no longer planned for Israel. So the Reformed theology could have been very successful until 1948 because there was no little, uh, you know, modern state of Israel. The Jews were dispersed all around the world. And it was easy to prove that God is done with them. But then May 14, 1948 came right. and a nation was born at once. And that was a black eye in the theology of replacement of the church, you know, and, and Israel by the church. And, and now they are a little bit, I would say, embarrassed. <laughs> and so they don't know how to approach that. Some of them are very, very courageous and they understand we were wrong. God is not done with Israel. We have a proof before our very eyes. Others are waiting, sitting on the fence to see whether Israel is just a timely thing or it's going, it's going to stay. Right. Believe it or not, I mean, people think we're not sure yet whether it's going to stay or not. Well, that's interesting because in the Bible it makes clear that once God establishes Israel, that He's not going to allow it to be scattered again. It's Absolutely. The nation will stand. Absolutely. It's also clear that God will bring us back from all the nations to which we were dispersed, and He will bring us back to our own land. And, and, and trust me, 19, in the 1940s, I'm talking about 1946, 47, 48, I mean, we were a nation that just survived a, a Holocaust where mm -hmm. two-thirds of the Jews in Europe were gone and no one helped us uh, and we in, in, we were against all odds we made it to a country we fought the war of independence where we should have lost probably because of all the countries that were well equipped and came upon us to destroy us and we not only won the war but we turned 75 years later to one of the strongest nations on planet Earth and definitely one that is moving and shaking in so many different areas. So how much comfort do you think now, modern day, um, what's taking place in the world, uh, politics and so forth right now, do you think that the Israeli people take in the fact that God promises the land will, the, the, the state of nation, uh, the nation of Israel will now stand forevermore? And now you have Hamas, you have Hezbollah, you have Iran, you have America sort of turning its back on Israel right now. So how much comfort do the Israeli people take in that biblical truth? Well, you know, I don't think we have a choice. Well, one of the things that Golda Meir said that, uh, uh, you know, in the 1970s, she said, we have a secret weapon. Our secret weapon is that we have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. That's our secret weapon. I mean, we're, we don't have 20 other Arab countries like the Arabs do. There is no other Jewish state, nowhere around the world. So we, we understand that we're here to stay. Now, with Hezbollah, we're going to have to deal. With Hamas, we are dealing right now. We had hostile American presidents before. We're having one right now. And even if we have one in the future, it's going to happen and we are still here. While those presidents are gone, Israel is still standing here. We're not here to go. We're not here to vanish. We are here to stay. And it's not by the will of men. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that they are finding out. Look, there is a clock, a countdown clock in somewhere in Tehran. For the last, I think, 15 years, they're trying to figure how many days are left for the Zionist entity to remain standing. And they always have to somehow update that uh, clock because it's not going according to their plan. Because God has a plan. God has a way for Israel. And the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah that... Um, only when the sun, the moon, and the stars will no longer be there, only then Israel will no longer be a nation before him. So, I mean, if they want to destroy us, they better aim their weapon towards the sun, the moon, and the stars <laughs> and destroy them first, because only then we won't be here. 
So I'm curious about your way of thinking when it comes to Bible pro prophecy. Do you flip on the news in the day or read the news uh, online and you see what's taking place and then you immediately put it through the prism of biblical yes. truths? Okay, so that, that's well, why Well, for me, Bible prophecy is not telling me what's going to happen every day. Okay. It gives me anchors. Mm -hmm. I know the Jews are to return back to the land. I know they have to prosper because the Bible says that while they're prosperous, safe, and secure, then there will be another big war coming from the north. I know who is going to come against me. I know that even then we are going to win, but not because of us, but because of him. That's the Ezekiel war, and God will win for us. I know there will be a great world leader that will rise to... a offer fake peace to the region. I know that at the end he will turn his back and come and betray the Jews and come against us. I know there will be a greater Holocaust than the one we've had so far. And I know that at the very end, all Israel will be saved. These are all things that are anchored in verses and scriptures and chapters of Bible books. And so I know they will happen. In between, mm -hmm. we have to fill the gap. For example, if the Bible is telling me that when the Ezekiel war comes, no one will come to help me, I can alone, I can already understand that something is going to happen between us and our allies that will cause them not to come and stand and, and help us militarily. So that is something that can explain to me why we will, if we're not seeing it now, we will definitely see it in the future, America will withdraw its support militarily and maybe even politically, I don't know. I, I, all I know is one thing. What the Bible says is going to happen. What we are going through right now is a fulfillment of it. And anything in between today and the next chapter in Bible prophecy can only be interpreted according to what we know from Bible prophecy, nothing else. So I'm not, look, again, I'm not a prophet. I come from a mm -hmm. nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do know the Bible, and I know Bible prophecy, so I, I can tell you with great assurance what is going to happen, not because I'm, I'm, I'm you know, smart, because God said in Isaiah 46, I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Right. So I have full confidence in Him. So let's talk about America and what's taking place with the Joe Biden administration right now. And I have to say, personally, I'm a little bit astonished at how open and blatant the anti-Semitism has become on America's college campuses. That's a little bit of a surprise to me. Not a surprise what this administration is doing insofar as it seems like tossing Israel under a bus a little bit. Um, I'm just wondering where you see that in the Bible prophecy. Do you see it? sort of fading out? Or do you see this being a turning point where America indeed is one of those nations that turns its yeah. back? Or is that the unknown? Well, I I again, I know that in the next chapter, which is the Ezekiel War, America will not help Israel militarily. It doesn't mean that Christians in America are not going to be standing there supporting Israel. It means that America, the official, is not going to be there, either because America is no longer a superpower, mm -hmm. something happened, implosion, explode, I don't know what, but something has to happen that will cause America no longer to be even willing or able to come and physically, militarily help Israel against its enemies. Now, what we see with the, the Biden administration right now is the tension between the two camps in the Democratic uh, Party and uh, you know, he has to appease both the woke, uh, uh, you know, side of, of it, which is very anti-Israel, anti-Semite, woke, and pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian. And at the same time, he has to remember that a big chunk of the support of the Democrats in America comes from the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So I think he went a bit too far. And I, I think he's going to feel that in the next few uh, polls. Um, and... Uh, and again, I'm not afraid. I'm mm -hmm. not afraid. I'm disappointed, yes, but it's expected. I, I, I don't want to see uh, America uh, going through bad things because I think you're the closest ally of this country. And, but I know the end uh, when it comes to Israel. I hate to say I don't see America in Bible prophecy. Right. So if anything has to worry uh, uh, anyone, 
It's what's going to happen in America, right. not what's going to happen in Israel. I know the end of the book, but when it comes to America, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And I know one thing, God will bless America as long as America is blessing Israel. This is the number one recipe in the Bible. When you bless Abraham's seed, you will be blessed. And so I, I feel for all of my American friends, the American, you know, Christians that are standing and praying and supporting unashamedly, supporting Israel. And I feel sad to see where America is going uh, politically because it affects you first, not us. I mean, look what's going on in your southern border. Look mm -hmm. what's going on with crime in America. Look what's going on with the economy. Everything affects you first. And so I think Americans understand this administration is one of the worst and and I think that they're trying now to appease the wrong people in the wrong way at the wrong time. And I don't think they've done one good thing in a good way in the last three years when it comes to foreign affairs. Right. They've, they've done every possible mistake in the book when it comes to their dealing with Iran, with their dealing with Afghanistan, where they're dealing with Turkey, they're dealing with the Palestinians, UNRWA, everything. It's one mistake after another. And the outcome is very simple. What do you see? War or peace? You see war. You see right. tension. You see chaos. You see terrorism. And uh, it's just obvious. I, I would agree with that, but I, I wouldn't call what the Democrat Party is doing right now a mistake so much as demonic. I, you know, I, I, I look at the Democrat Party of today, and it's certainly not the same party as it was under JFK or even Bill Clinton. This, this Democrat Party just seems intent on destroying not just America, but turning its back on Israel. Yeah. Well, see, you know, you're mm -hmm. an American. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You know mm -hmm. better. I, I'm not well versed with your inner politics as much as you, you are. But uh, f from an outside position, I can tell you, it doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look good. And, and w we can only attest to how it affects us or the Middle East. Um, you can see the one that was the president before Biden. You can Trump, see, right. you can He's clearly great. see, right. yeah. you can see his <clears throat> policies. You could call him crazy. You could call him egomaniac, whatever you want. But peace came to the Middle East, not war. Mm -hmm. the, the Abraham Accords were the result of a decisive, strong person who knew exactly to call out, uh, you know, the bad guys and to uh, stand by his allies. What we see now is exactly the opposite. The allies are being punished and the bad guys are being rewarded. Yes, exactly. And, and people I've spoken with just in the last day, day and a half I've been here, uh, the one common theme that they've said in terms of, of a remark is that is Israelis feel very alone right now, yeah. which, is, which is sort of sad to hear. It's because sad. as an American, we, you know, my community supports Israel, number one. That's true. I must say that you're right, but I will tell you also that biblically, the nation of Israel was meant to be alone. Right. If you read the prophecy of Balaam that he declared, he said, here from afar I see a nation not reckoning itself among other, uh, others, but standing alone. It's a prophetic calling upon Israel. And whenever the Israelis wanted to be like everybody else, that was their stumbling block. That was their snare. They always <laughs> fell. All throughout history, throughout biblical history, throughout recent history. Um, look, even now, all the pro progressive liberal Jews, what do they see now? That being progressive and liberal was not enough. People are now hating them for just being a Jew. That's mm -hmm. it. It's not enough that you're a liberal anymore. It's not enough that you're progressive. Now you're, you're friends in the academia, in the entertainment, all of they come against you. And they don't even want to believe that what you say is the truth. If you say women were raped here, it's subject to their interpretation. But if the other side says women were raped, it's not subject to any one interpretation. You know, the, only today, the, the former uh, manager of Al Jazeera admitted that the claims that Israeli troops raped women in the Al Shifa hospital two, two, two three days ago mm -hmm. were all false. But they were echoed everywhere all right. around <laughs> social media and Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. Nobody called their bluff. Nobody was willing to even hold them accountable. And the only reason why they come clean right now is because it was actually 
backfiring on them because now a lot of Gazans started fleeing to the south. They were afraid Israeli troops are going to rape their daughters. <laughs> and that was exactly what they don't want. They, they want people to return to the northern part of Gaza. So when they saw that it doesn't work according to their plan, they had to come clean and say, no, no, it was all fabricated. You see, but even they had to come clean. Nobody held them accountable. But when we say women were raped, you, we don't see any Look, all the feminist organization, all the UN, UN human rights organization, no one came to stand, condemn Hamas, right. and stand on our side. So now, there's a shock among the liberal Jews, shock among the progressive Jews, because they did not see that one coming. Now, if October 7th would have happened in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, and 1,200 settlers would have been slaughtered, Everything would have been fine with so many Israelis, trust me, because it's their fault. They should have known. They should have, uh, you know, because the occupiers, they, yeah, they right? occupy. Okay. What a, but look what happened. <laughs> right. The October 7th mostly hit the most liberal, progressive, left wing, pro-Palestinian Israelis. They were helping the Palestinians, Correct. right? Prior to And that. not only yes. that, when the Palestinians entered into those kibbutzim, they said, we are in the settlements. Because for them, every Jew is a settler. And every Israeli town and village, whether it's in Judea or Samaria or not, it's a settlement. So everyone start to waking up right now and understand that, wait a minute, this is not exactly what we thought. We thought that they will be okay if we withdraw from Judea and Samaria. We thought that they will be okay if we withdraw from Gaza. They will never be okay. The chant that governments is allowing to be chanted along the streets of Europe and America is from the river to the sea. It's not from uh, anything but the entire territory of the state of Israel today. Right. A genocidal chant. Uh, and, and everybody's okay with that. Which is interesting because in the book of Joshua, which I was just reading, uh, God shows Joshua from the river to the sea, Absolutely. right? The land that will belong to the Jews. Yeah. So if anything, we should say from the river to the sea, the Bible says that we will be free. Right. I mean, but again, no one cares about that. No one cares about facts. No one cares about history. People care about narrative. People care about what sounds better, what sounds cooler. And you see, uh, you know, a disaster now in the academia, in the in the in, the, in colleges in America and all across Europe and other places in Australia and New Zealand. It's terrible. It's terrible. And, and the the disaster goes on. And I know I, I just want to sidestep really quickly because you raised this interesting point that nobody cares about the truth. And what what really is destructive, in my view, in the media, you see so much coverage of Israel and the war, but without context. It's just what happens Correct. then, and whichever whichever victim looks the saddest, they'll put in the media. And I, I just wonder how destructive is that in Israel when they see the international media doing coverage that really doesn't put history in context in there. Again, for some of us, we've seen that forever. Forever. But for many Israelis, uh, they wake up to this reality right now. So, and again, so I see there's a lot of sobering up uh, among the Israelis nowadays. Um, but, you know, again, they don't understand that uh, there's a lot of uh, what I call Pallywood, you know, it's a lot of acting among the Palestinians. The numbers that Hamas is giving the world regarding casualties, nobody checks them. Nobody, is, they take their word that if this is, you know, this is uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, Even giving Joe us, Biden. Of yes. course. <coughs> and then when you yes. ask him, can you prove, no, I take, I use the numbers that the Palestinian Ministry of Health is providing, but who is controlling the Ministry of Health? Hamas, it's a Hamas government. And by the way, every possible way you can uh, analyze those numbers, they're fabricated. They're fabricated because that's not even making sense. It doesn't even make sense. Now, apparently, no terrorist is dead there because it's only women and children. Um, all they give you is, is whatever works better for their propaganda. Now, by the way, in a war, innocent civilians always die. Mm -hmm. But what Israel is now doing is fighting a new type of warfare that has never been fought in the history of mankind. We are fighting 
on three main arenas. One is above the ground, one is underneath the ground, and one is in the media. Right. These are three things that we have to always fight and always come up with, with the real, real-time real data. And, and I think that um, we are actually uh, probably one of the most moral con uh, countries and militaries that exist in the world. I don't want to tell you what the American army did when, when there was time to put an end to a big war after so many uh, uh, Navy uh, uh, people were killed in, uh, in uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. I don't want to tell you what the Russians uh, were doing when they were attacked. Look, if we let terrorists walk with underwear, people criticize us. But when a terrorist in Russia has his ear cut off and put into his mouth and then electrocuted in his genitals, Nobody says a word. And he just killed, uh, I don't know, 100 people, whereas these terrorists killed over 1,200 innocent people in one day. All I'm saying is that there's, we are getting used to this double standard, but it's mm -hmm. just so <laughs> hypocritical. And uh, there's really not much we can do about it beside doing what we right. do right now. Right. fight as much as we can fight, pray, and understand that this world is not really our place. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think the war in the media is the hardest one to win. Uh, so I, I wanted to speak specifically about Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. You're very interesting, yes. so it was easy to get off track a little bit. But just take a look at what's going on right now with the war, with what's taking place in America, and sort of just you know talk about what you're seeing in terms of biblical truths taking yes. place in yeah. modern Israel or in the world? Well, so I'm seeing a couple of things that are going on. I'm seeing the decline of an empire. This is what I, how I describe what's happening in America. Okay. I see a decline of an empire mm -hmm. on all levels. I see it happening. I see at the same time, Israel is getting its ties with its neighbors that are Sunni, moderate countries, stronger actually. I don't know if, if you know that, but throughout the war, as a bypass to the Red Sea route, we started a land route. Uh, we're using trucks to, uh, uh, to bring goods all the way across from the Emirates through Saudi Arabia and Jordan into Israel right now. What we see is that all these countries that on the paper should have condemned us, cut ties with us, and be against us are actually strengthening their ties with us. They can't wait for the war to be over to already sign peace with us right. because they see that the alternative is Iran getting stronger and eventually threatening them as well. So biblically, it fits exactly the scenario of the Ezekiel, the eve of the Ezekiel war. Because when you look at what is going to happen, who is going to come against Israel? It's going to be Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, and Libya. And who is going to stand there and criticize that attack on Israel, Sheba and Didan, which is the Saudi Peninsula, and uh, the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions of Tarshish, which is what we think is Europe and America, they will criticize the attack. They're not going to come and help us, but they will definitely protest that war that is coming against Israel. So you, it's very phenomenal if you really think about it. If 10 years ago I would have told you, that Saudi Arabia yes. and the Gulf states are actually more on our side right. than they are on the side of the Palestinians, you would call me uh, a dreamer or some, some sort of a, a hallucinating person. But that's the case right now. By the way, m Egypt wants us to finish Hamas. Saudi wants us to finish Hamas. The UAE wants us to finish Hamas. Nobody likes them. That's the Muslim Brotherhood that is outlawed in all of these mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. So biblically, I see how we are on a fast track towards the fulfillment of the Ezekiel war. Okay. And so I believe we're gonna win and get stronger out of, out of this one because to enter into that war, we need to be s prosperous, safe and secure with uh, alliances all around us. So looking out then, should we have our eyes on what's going to take place with Russia, Ukraine, or should we be looking at Damascus, or what, what should we be looking at for yeah. the next check mark? See, I, I always said that Damascus is going to be the match that uh, starts the whole fire. Okay. Because, look, the Bible says in, in, in 
Isaiah chapter 17, that Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap, uninhabitable one. Damascus never ever ceased from being a city. Throughout history, from the day it was built, it was damaged, it was partially destroyed, but it has always been inhabited. There will come a moment when the, something big is going to happen that will completely destroy that city. And my guess is, only a guess, again, I, I have the anchors mm -hmm. and I have my assessment. My assessment is that this type of event can be the catalyst for Russia, Turkey and Iran to come against Israel because they will most likely blame Israel for that one. Okay. Um, I see that one happening. I see, of course, Damascus has to be destroyed. It's a Bible prophecy. It, it will happen. Rosh, Meshach, Tuval, uh, Persia, Gomer, the house of Togarma, Libya, and Kush, all of them, these are all countries that will come against Israel. The Bible says so. So I, I do see Israel coming out of this conflict stronger, prosperous, and eventually Russia is going to come and lead a war against us, which means that at some point Russia has to overcome and be the strongest part, the stronger uh, uh, part in the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war. I mean, if Russia is going to be crushed by the Ukrainian and NATO, right. it wouldn't be able to come against us. But it will be emboldened to come against us when they already have great achievement over there. Okay. So, I mean, look, it's, uh, if I was uh, a NATO member in Europe, I would be very worried right now. So I, I just have one last question, one last topic, I, and I'm not sure if you follow this at all, but I've been, I've been hearing quite a bit, um, just whispers in the Christian community and elsewhere that we need to watch out for this upcoming uh, April 8th. There's going to be some kind of uh, eclipse, mm -hmm. and if you go by biblical truths, God puts his signs in the stars and the moon and so forth. So I just wonder if you know yeah. anything about that topic. Well, um, every few years, we mm -hmm. have something like that coming up, like the, the, the blood moon tetrad, the sign in the skies on, uh, in 2017, um, and now this one. Look, Christians need to understand most of what is written both in the book of Joel and by Jesus himself in the gospel, as well as what the book of Revelation says, these are events that will take place during the tribulation. Gotcha. And therefore, okay. by, by hinting that something big is going to happen is, in a way, without saying, you're basically declaring the beginning of the tribulation, the seven years tribulation, which I strongly uh, disagree with, because I believe that as long as the church is here, the mm -hmm. tribulation cannot start. The tribulation must start when the rise of the Antichrist is, and he, that begins the last week the last week of Daniel's 70 weeks, which is the, the seven years of tribulation. So I think that there's a lot of um, misunderstanding, a lot of commotion and sensationalism. And I personally know people that uh, walked away from faith because of the hype of the tetrad of the, the blood moons and yes, whereas nothing happened. Right. <laughs> and I, I know someone told me his mom left faith because of that. That so much was said, so much was prepped, so much was hyped, and then nothing happened. And we need to be very careful. The Bible is already sensational enough. We don't need to add to it anything. And remember, the signs in the sky, anything that has to do with the, the, the sun turning dark or the, the, the moon turning like a blood, these are signs during the tribulation. And I don't think we should be here to see it. Therefore, I don't think we need to be too excited or too sensationalist about this whole thing. We need to be very careful. There's so much that we can be excited about right. and so much that we need to be excited about. I wouldn't add to it anything. Uh, I appreciate you putting that in a little cooler head context. So. Interesting times, yes. yes very and we good. can, uh, on, on April 9th, we can talk again. Love to, yes. <laughs> and see yes. how's everything. Okay. All right, Amir, thank you so much for thank being on Bulletin's Line. So great to have you. Thank you.